you have a prepaid call from an inmate at Blythe, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using... So what do you go by? Why well, I used to go by little, little feet. What's your nationality? Black and Puerto Rican. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Were you ever part of any gangs, groups, organizations? I was part of a gang. Would you able to clarify exactly what gang that is? Uh, Grape Street Watts. And where exactly is it located at? Watts, California. Okay, can you elaborate on um, your upbringing as a child and what eventually led you into joining Gray Street? Well, coming out here from Chicago, around three years old, my mother moved to Watt, which is right next door to Compton and Long Beach. It's a little town. And my uncles were, you know, were from the same gang as, as, as I was, or they was from the gang before I was. So I pretty much emulated those that were in my family, which was my uncles, and that's who I looked up to. That's how it really all started. It was the environment I was at, you know. I, I was I, I was a product of the environment, the Jordan Projects. Okay, can you clarify with the audience um, from... Um, from my experience, and um, you guys are Crips, correct? Right. And would you be able to elaborate on um, who you guys were beefing with out there in that area? Well, we were beefing with Bunny Hunter Bloods, which is located in Watts, in the in 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 further projects from ours. We were beefing with another project called PJ Watts, which is Imperial Court Project. And we beefed with a few Mexicans, which was Colonial Watts, F-13, and other little local gangs that was kind of small gangs that really don't even exist no more now like they did in the 90s. Okay, what are you convicted of and how long is your sentence? And how long have you been incarcerated? 25 years. Are you going any going through any type of appeals? Well, in the beginning, I went to two appeals, or I did two appeals in the process of that. It didn't work out. So now, a few Senate bills have passed in regards of me fitting the criteria of my case like others that been down like I have when they were juveniles. And we're up under a SB bill called Senate Bill SB 261. And that's a juvenile youth defender uh, 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 bill to where we go to the board and they have, a, they have to have a consideration to find us suitable to reunite out there in society only if we fit the criteria with our behavior on being reformed and different from what we were when we first came in. Certain insight, insight to your crime, who you are now, who do, who were you then, what was your causative factors, do, are you familiar and can, and, and can you identify your defects? Stuff like that, because back then, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a young man back then, guys my age couldn't even identify that, let alone know who they were. We were we were searching for who we were. That's why we, a lot of us were in gangs. And a lot of people don't know that about gangs, because gangs, they attract youngsters like me and others due to lack of attention from our own family, our parents. And it's easy for us to be manipulated and we were impressed.
impressionable to get be involved in gang, especially when you're in a gang or you're attracted to a gang that you know that that, that gang has a lot of people fear. You want to be a part of something that people fear. Most of the time, that's how it starts, with pride issues. We've been bullied when we were younger, so we get this gang, this gang protect us, this gang become our, our, our family, our brothers. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. How old were you when you got when you first caught the case? Eighteen years old. Okay. Um, without self incrimination and incriminating others, can you elaborate in your own words, in your own narrative, on how the events that occurred? Um, on how you caught your case, and do you believe, since you got double life, I'm gathering that um, you took a trial and lost, that's what I'm gathering, and do you believe that you got a fair trial and a fair sentence, considering the role you played in the crime? Well, an uh, incident or a situation transpired well, me and two other guys on our way to a 98 cent store in San Bernardino. Now, San Bernardino is a place where a lot of gangs out there don't like LA gang, first and foremost. They despise of us for some odd reason. So, during this era, during this time in the 90s, this era was, uh, it was, it got real racist um, with the Mexicans and the blacks, especially out there. And going to this 98 cent store with two other guys, we were just casually going from a motel to the 98 cent store. Going there, but getting nasty quick. I will never forget this day. The two grandma oatmeal cookies. And the guy at the counter, which I knew close, that worked at the 98 cent store, which was an Iranian man by the name of Harry, I told him, let me put this on my tab. He said, yes. When I leave out, I get on the phone and call my dead girlfriend that stayed in Redmond. My two other friends stayed there purchasing their stuff. Five Mexicans walked in. I walked right by them. But as I walked right by them, I felt the negative vibe already. When you're in the game, you feel a vibe. You know who's going to so-called, what we call set trip on you. They're going to start tripping. That's the looks, the mad dog, and, 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 and the what's up, homie, and, and where you from. You know, it's been a beginning. So as I'm walking by, I'm hearing this. So when I get on the phone, I'm talking to my girlfriend at the time for about like five minutes. And so I see my friend come running out, but he's backpedaling. I don't see my other friend. So, it's a guy coming out with another younger uh, Mexican guy, but the older Mexican guy got the machete, charging one of my friends. They got into a quick scuffle in there, and then the guy took the machete out, and then that's when he chased my friend outside the 98 cent store. So the owner of the store even came out. So when he came out, he's trying to <clears throat> simmer down the situation. So I'm looking at my friend with one of my hands up in the phone to my to my to my ear and saying, What's up? What happened? And he wasn't talking, he just looked at me and he was backpedaling. He kinda of backpedaled to the curb of the street and there was cars. This is in broad daylight. So the guy with the machete looked over at me and was like he was like, You think you tough too? You think you bad homes? So he started walking up to me. Now, being a gang member a particular gang member, you know, you stay strapped. You always have a... You have 60 seconds remaining. ...for protection. Okay, so the guy stole, he walked up to me with the machete in his hand. And as a gang member, and a particular gang member, I'm strapped. I have a weapon on me at all times. So I pull my weapon out. But when I pull my weapon out, as like most of the times, I'm thinking that that will temperature check you to bow down. And that didn't do that to this guy. Neither did it do the, 
the other guy that was with him. The guy with the machete is still walking up to me at this phone booth. And when he got uh, close enough to where once he got close, uh, his, his movement became a little faster. I just shot. I moved back, still holding the phone at the same time, and I shot. I think I shot about like four or five times or whatever. But I noticed that when I was shooting, he was still functioning like, like I wasn't even penetrating. It, it, it was weird. And that's what made me kept shooting. I remember that because I, I noticed he didn't stop. At this time, um, I ran. And before I knew it, the next day, it was in the newspaper that a guy was shot and dead. And at that moment, I knew I was going to be on the run because I wasn't going to turn myself in. And I knew no one, especially authorities, wasn't going to understand that that was self-defense. Although, yeah, it was game, but I didn't have no attention on starting anything. Did I have intention on protecting myself and shooting somebody? Of course. That's why I had the weapon on me. That was my mentality at that time. But at that moment and that day, I never had no intentions on starting nothing to premeditate to kill anyone. That was not. That was. We was just chilling, having fun, drinking, smoking weed at this motel room with some females, and we was just going to get some more drink, more little snacks or whatever, and go back to this room where we had little females at. That was it. I never left out that motel room with the intention on trying to harm anybody that day. And um, as far as the courts and how they rule this whole situation in regards to me, I felt like it was fair. Looking back now, who I am now, on how much I mentally grew, it, it was absolutely fair. Okay, um, I myself, I grew up as an Asian gang member out here in the IE era. And I'm familiar with the San Bernardino area. Um, you know, I went there before with other homies, and uh, we get surrounded in the West Side Redugo, Mount Vernon area. And I understand your situation to where you have to defend yourself when the individuals surrounding you, because they believe you went to their turf and you don't belong there. Um, I, I totally understand that concept. Uh, my question to you is, um, when you first went to prison to hit the main line, what was your mentality? Uh, my mentality was doing everything I can to stay down and, and, and be relevant. And not and, and not and not and not think you gotta swim. You know, especially where I went, leaving the reception center, which was Wasco State Prison, going straight to Crescent City and Pelican Bay. That's where they sent me with level four 270 points, not 180 points. However, they sent me there knowing I had 270 points. And older guys were telling me that I was trying to explain this to me. But I didn't know no difference. And sometimes you don't want you don't want to look like you're weak by accepting something like that. Instead, you will, you will, you will say, which was my response, oh, I ain't tripping on but then when I went there, I understood why the Mo Jesus was telling me, no, this is the wrong place they put you. You need to talk to your counsel. You're going to go to a 270 design, get a little freedom. It's wide open. You're going to a maximum security. Your first prison, they said you to kind of get back there. I'm supposed to do that to you. Y'all see, you've never been to prison before. But the pride wouldn't allow me to get at no counselor to tell me not to go to Pelican Bay with peers my age and my area around me that wasn't doing that neither. Um, my question to you is, you say they didn't catch you right away when you committed that crime or that, or that this didn't happen. How did they end up catching you eventually? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Well, uh, I was helping out two female close friends. Um, I ended up going on a robbery with them because they was trying to make some money, feed their little, little, little babies. And um, I ended up going on a robbery, just a little weak, maybe that's a robbery, man. And we got away, man. And, and 
when we were on the freeway, I was telling my homegirl that was driving to drop me off to residence. And she was like, okay. So we was on our way to residence on the freeway. She had a cracked windshield. So a sheriff on the other side of the freeway coming the opposite way noticed the crack. Well, now, what we didn't realize is that that sheriff then got off the freeway and hopped back on the freeway, busted the U on our side of the freeway, coming behind us, casually following us from a distance until they started getting close. And then it was three sheriffs behind us. And that's how I actually got caught. I went in there, well, I told them I had a fake name, but they ended up discovering who I was. And they locked us all up. It was me, my cousin, and two of my uh, female friends. They ended up taking little deals or whatever. And out that little group, I the only one ended up catching all this time, and I was in the 90s. Okay, as a great few crib, I'm going to a level four, uh, 270 yard. Um, you ran with the Crips. A 180. A 180, I'm sorry, a 180 yard. You ran with the Crips. Um, can you explain, because I know they got different Crip uh, sets in there or different Crip uh, cars up in there, for lack of word. Um, can you explain exactly what type of Crip car you're from? Would it be from neighborhood or, or gangster Crip or, or whatever it might be? Um, and also, what challenges have you faced at uh, the level 4 180? And also, um, can you elaborate on what kind of altercations that you got in, that you were involved in because you had to, or, or or any riots or anything of that nature, and what sparked the riot, and who was it against? Well, my personal uh, group I was under at that time, and I ran with, as far as what we are titled as, is Grape Streets. And we're Crips, but we have a car that's called Hub and Dub, which is the Compton and Watts car. We don't belong to any other Crip car but that car. We are in 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 uh in the format or projecting other Crips, but we do our own thing because we're Compton and Watts. We got our own little region, and that's been since the seventies. That's just the history of that. But then, uh, 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 I'm an ex gang member, I'm not a gang member anymore, but at that time, and I need to stipulate that, but at that time, being from Grape Street and being a member in gang banging, uh, I did things, but it was more so having a uniform on. I, I, I acted real good, not to mention. My, my reputation, I had a good reputation on the streets to where I didn't really have to earn my keep like a lot of other guys needed to when they came to prison that wasn't known, that wasn't put their work out there, that the prison didn't hear about. And I have family and older homies, and I was from, I was, uh, I was, I was an individual up under an older homie, which is Big Feet, had been down since the 80s. So he's well known in prison. And his crime is well known in prison. So I was just being up under that that old head crew and my uncles them, I was already well known. So I didn't have to really do drastic things that I witnessed them having other guys my age do. So the typical things that I did do while in prison was just race ride with South Siders and whites. And this is common in prison when it comes to being who I am as a black. I could have been a blood. It still would have resolved in me having to be involved in a ride against either Mexicans or white. Never stabbed anyone, never took it to that level. Only this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I only had one mutual combat since I've been in prison, which I'm, I'm blessed and thankful for. I slid through the cracks, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I know now that I'm blessed because of that, because I don't have those things on my jacket. I don't have a saw on my jacket like that, just a stabbing, just 
stuff like that. It's just pretty much mutual stuff, you know, typical little rides and stuff like that. Nothing against staff. Yeah, I got little write-ups that's dealing with um, threat on staff or whatever, but that's about it. As far as when it gets dangerous like that against staff, but never really harm nobody, man. Not, 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 not to the extent that got me up in here. I never competed. I never did. I never repeated that that pattern. Okay, bro. What do you have to say to the to the youngsters, to the youth out here that's involved in gang activity or thinking about joining gangs, bro? Man, first and foremost, as a mentor up under this program, we started right here at Chuckawala on BR called YOP Youth Defender Program. Now, we had mentees that we train, we school, we mentor. And just like I told them, look at my situation. Look at his situation. Every one of us that was mentors in there had a story. We had a situation, and they not, some knew about it. Some know of us. Now, things have changed when it comes to game making. The brotherly love thing is over with. It's all about manipulation. If any youngster want to get in the game and get manipulated, then you're just giving your life away. That's all you're doing because that's exactly what they're doing right now. They're not your friends. They're not your brothers. They're not your family. Even if you have family in a game, they are not your family. They're just not. It's going to tarnish you. It's going to mess your life up like it did me. Everyone's been dying. There's two people in, in, in my family. I haven't even met. I haven't even met my grandson. I haven't even met my grandson. And couldn't. It's just so much stuff, man. And it, it just messed your life up, man. You know, and you're labeled for the rest of your life in the eyes of certain individuals. And you can't take that back. The only thing you can do, like me, is live in the bins. Everything you do is living in the bins for all the people you victimize because when you gang banging, that's what you do. You victimize people. That's all you do is victimize people and it's going to catch up with you. So I advise all the youngsters out there, man, do not join the gang and get manipulated like that. It's a whole new day. You don't have to even gang bang no more. It's all about getting a job or go make some money, go hustle, go look out for your family. Get on the internet, try to make a brand out of yourself or something. It's so easy now to, be, to, to, to become successful. Do you have anything else to, uh, I don't have no further questions for you, but do you have anything else to uh, address or add? Well, that's, that's pretty much it. You have 60 seconds remaining. Okay, would you like to give like a, a shout out or thanks to... Um, your family and friends or to the audience or anything of that nature? Uh, I like to, of course, give a shout out to my family, friends, my grandson, most importantly, and my son and my wife. But I also want to say this for the record that today, and out of all of what I've done, I make a point and I make a conscious point every day, living my life in the men. Living my life by honoring those I victimize, especially the individual. And I hopefully this won't, you know, affect anything by saying his name, Norman Galascos. That was one of my victims, you know, and he's no longer here. You know, I took, I feel like I took so much from him, I robbed him, you know. I don't even know if this man had kids. And when you get at a certain age, these are the things you think about, you know. And I just live for him and other victims now, man, you know, wholeheartedly. And it's easy for people like me to say this, and people hear a lot of us saying this, but I have made a point by putting a lot of the things that I go off of and how my thinking is on Facebook. 
That's why I write the things I write on my Facebook, positive things, giving people insight, knowledge about certain things. Because that's part of my living to be. It's part of me feeling like I'm giving back. And I feel like that's fine with me because I'm doing that other than what I used to do. And it's better doing that nowadays. And that's just it. When you know better, you do better, man. Okay, bro. I appreciate bro. you giving me this opportunity. 